And um, it's a two-page paper um, that you bring to class. It's no big deal. I, I would suggest highly getting it done first. Don't bother handwriting it, trying to turn it in at the last second. Um, what else can I tell you? It, it's easy. I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, reinforcement of what we've already talked about. It, you know, I hope you guys don't mind it, really. It's kind of fun, I think, but whatever. Um, so there it is, due next or a week from today. So there you go. Um, quiz number one is kind of on the horizon right now. I'm not sure. We're going to cover the material today, you know, probably next Tuesday. So maybe we're looking at next Thursday for quiz one, maybe next Tuesday, the following Tuesday. Um, I'll let you know. I mean, when you're ready, you're ready. I'm not going to force you to say, okay, you have to, you know. When we're done and we're ready to do it, we'll do it. It might be Thursday, it might be next Tuesday. It just sort of depends how fast we go. Um, anything else I'm missing? I don't think so. Okay. We have to finish this up, and then we'll go into the next thing. So we got through the, the trade-off between uh, inflation and unemployment. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. No, we all have to go. They're further back than I thought. Okay. Um, this is macro or micro? Micro. Micro. Okay. 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 Up there. <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> Lacking oxygen there for a second. <laughs> All right, so um, we did the 10 principles. Everybody okay with that? I, I mean, I'll just real quick, just to kind of refresh your memory. I don't go through them. The trade offs, you know, why are you here? What did you about to get? Your second best choice is what you didn't do. Um, that is your opportunity cost. And so, I mean, even though you could be playing video games, but you wouldn't be, then that's not really an opportunity cost for you. Thinking at the margin that we, you know, we buy oranges up to where we know we're going to. The last dollar we spend is equal to the value of the last orange we buy. We don't think in terms of increments, it would take too long. Um, incentives, that was pretty easy. You know, the pay goes up, more people are willing to help out at the house. Um, the rich countries like the United States are able to produce because we have lots of land labor capital. Um, poor countries like Haiti are unable to produce, but not because the people are unproductive, but rather the, the uh, economy there won't support their productivity. Uh, inflation uh, and unemployment, we talked about that. Trade can make everybody better off. We talked about the, you know, the workers coming to this country, allowing people here to go to school. The market, the grocery store thing, and then governments, how, you know, the dam up there in Keswick. Does that sound right? Um, okay, so now we're going to go into, don't, don't write any of this down, just let me fly through it because it's not really that important. What, what they're talking about here is they're saying that economics is like any other science and that, that, you know, there's its own language, it's its own thing, like you see here, like there's law terms and psychology terms and everything else. And, you know, so I guess the point here is just to say that economics, I think a lot of people, I think, will, will say, well, it's a spin-off of like finance or something like that, but it's really not. It's its own entity and you can major in economics and you can, you know, specialize in economics and so it's its own thing and so don't not nothing to do, but, but I think a lot of people think, oh, it's just a you know shoot an offshoot of business or something, but it's really not. Um, alternatives, you know, the, the the opportunity cost is for that economic way of thinking, and then use of the scientific method. And let me make a quick note about this, and this is worth jotting down because it's probably going to be on detail. And um, just real quick, if you're texting, I'm I'm not kidding. I will throw you out. It's simple, and, and you've been warned. So that's it. All right, so that's one warning. I'll give you two more, and then I'm going to start throwing people out of the class, and I'm not kidding. All right. So the use of the scientific method is pretty, um, it's, it's the same, you know, if you're talking about psychology or, or with um, any, you know, chemistry, anything at all, you know, it's the same thing, is that the scientific method is to simply um, hypothesize, test, analyze, Rehypothesize, and, and that's an uh, exam question, sort of a, you know, not a big deal, but just, you guys probably all know that anyway. So the scientific method, hypothesize, test, analyze, rehypothesize. Rehypothesize. Re so make a theory, 
test it, analyze the test to make another theory. <laughs> to try to take an economy and you want to say, well, I want to, I want to see how um, inflation works or how marginal product works or whatever, that the problem with, with it is there's all these variables that go into marginal product, right? There's all these things that happen. And I, I mean, if you've heard the statement, holding everything else constant, you know, you, you have to do that because if you don't, all the variables start to weigh down on your um, hypothesis so heavily that you lose touch of what it is you're trying to accomplish. And so, so I'm, I'm testing marginal product of labor, but I have to say, well, I'm just going to say that wages are constant and, you know, the firm is constant, output is constant. Everything has to sort of be held stable for a second for me to watch that marginal product of labor. Does that make sense? Um, and Greenspan was the one that said that, and that if you get too many variables, then all of a sudden the model starts to fall apart. It becomes too heavy on itself. Um, one of the things, and, and certainly, certainly, I don't mean any disrespect, and I, I, I should just make note of it, but um, there's a little offshoot of the Amish somewhere up in Ohio, and uh, forgive me, I just don't remember who it is. It's, it's they're uh, like a subset of the Amish community up there. Does uh, Mennonite sound right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mennonite. And, um, the, what they have, they, they've renounced the American um, economy, and, and, and that's actually federally against the law, but, you know, whatever. And what they've done is they've come up with their own currency, and they've, they've got the, kind of their own barter system, and yada, yada, and they don't rely on American currency. They have their own. And um, it, it's a lot of economists these days are, are interested in looking at the Mennonite economy because it's a really small little micro-economy that a lot of the variables can be taken into account because they're small enough to where, you know, it's, it's whatever, 500 people. So it's not like, you know, millions and millions and millions of variables, you know. All right, um, so there's that. You make the, uh, make the assumptions to make the world easier to understand. This is all just kind of artsy stuff. Okay, um, now there's two models that we're going to look at in this class. The first one is the circular flow. Second one is the production possibilities. Um, the one that you guys will need to know for sure is the PPF. I mean, you'll need to know both, but the, the important one is the latter. Um, but we'll start with circular flow. Um, and let me make this bigger. Um, okay, circular flow diagram is a visual model that shows the factors of production that go through an economy and the money that goes through an economy in the other direction. And sorry for those of you who've seen this before, I'm just lazy. <laughs> I haven't changed it. <laughs> I, should, I probably should come up with a different one for the other class, but it's the same principle, so same book, same everything. I'm not, the first three chapters are again. Right All of a sudden, it gets like, oh, they really considered how that, you know, that production happens, and, and I think it's kind of interesting for some folks. 
All right, so on the, on the four sides here, the top and bottom, and then the two sides. Um, over here we have the households, that's you and me. Over here is the firms, let's say that's Shasta College and Starbucks. Um, the market for resources is down at the bottom, I'll talk about that, and the market for goods and services is up at the top. All right, we'll, stop, we'll start with you and me. Okay, we're the households, that's us. Okay, And what we supply in the market, in the economy, is we supply land, labor, and capital. That's what we have. Most of us are, you know, I don't mean to exclude anybody, but most of us, what do we have? Of those three things, what do we have? Labor. Labor. Most of us. I mean, there might be a few, like I said, I'm, who knows, maybe a few of your families own lots of, um, you know, farmland, I don't know. Maybe some of, some of you own lots of uh, construction company or your family does or something like that. Who knows? But, but for the most part, most people like me, I don't really offer much but my labor. That's what I have. So we supply our land, labor, and capital into the market. Um, you know, somebody like um, I'm trying to th what the McConnell Foundation. They supply a lot of land. They grant a lot of land out. Um, laborers, you and me, capital. Just to define it, is um, equipment used to make other things. So, so ca in, and I understand in finance, capital is like um, you know investment capital, uh, ten thousand dollars to buy a business. That's capital in finance. In economics, capital is um, equipment. Things that I use, like a backhoe, or a building, or a barn, or things that can be used to create other things, okay? Kind of an important little distinction there. Um, so we supply our land labor capital into that market for land labor capital, the resource markets. And then the firms take it, and we'll talk about Chester College. Shasta College actually does a service, and, and it's like, you think, well, it's just kind of a combination of things that become what a firm is, and it's actually not. Firms are standalone entities that sort of distill the land labor capital into something we can use. And, and let me tell you kind of what I'm saying. Like, Shasta College organizes the class. They, they have a way to pay for it. They have the labor, me, you know, the instructor. They have the capital, the building, and the air conditioner, and the, and the, you know, the walkways to the classrooms. They have the land and the campus. And so what they do, what Chester College does, is they organize all of that into something usable. Because if you take all those parts, it really doesn't matter. But it has to be organized, yeah? It has to be put in one place at one time so everybody can sort of use it all at the same rate. So they take it, they organize the class, they... they put us all in the same room, they you know, tell us the time, they do all that stuff, and here we are. And here's the labor, here's the capital, the land is you know, the campus, and here we are. And they've created something bigger than the sum of its parts. Does that make sense? Same with Starbucks. I mean, the labor is the barista, the capital is the building, um, the land, of course, may be actually very small for the store, but you know, I, I don't know if they actually own land in, in South America. I mean, they could, I guess, but I'm not sure about that. But, but anyway, you get the point. And so they take all these individual parts and they, they distill it or homogenize it down into one product, which is a good cup of coffee. And then we can just walk into Starbucks and order a cup of coffee, but think about the components that go into it that Starbucks organizes for us. Does that make sense? All right, so, so they take our land labor capital, which are the factors of production, and then the firms organize it and then make goods and services, coffee, classes, whatever. And then it goes into the market, which is at the top for stuff, market for goods and services, and then guess who buys the crap that we make? We do, right? You're a barista at Starbucks, and I'm an instructor at Shasta College. So Shasta College organizes classes, right? And, and you guys come get your economics class, and I go to Starbucks to get a cup of coffee. And so we actually buy each other's commodities. Does that make sense? All right, um, any questions about that? Pretty simple. And, and I think that's kind of an eye-opener, because I think, I think students, I mean, I don't know this, but I think that students sort of just say, well, land, labor, capital, how? There's a cup of coffee. And it's not quite that simple. There has to be some administration, which is the firm. All right, going in the other direction is the money. And um, I'll just start somewhere. It gets kind of round and round. So um, let's just start with the firms. Of, uh, the money going down in this way. Um, so the firms go to the market for the factors of production, the land, labor, capital, 
And in return for land labor capital, the firms give us wages for the labor, rent for the land, and profit for the capital. All right, so there that is. So they, they, they take our land labor capital and they give us wages, rent, and profit. That wages, rent, and profit turns into our cumulative income. It's what we make for our land labor capital, right? Okay, and then we take our we take our income, and what do we do with it? Spend it, right? We go out, we spend our income, and we go into the product market. We go to Starbucks or to Shasta College or wherever we go. We buy stuff, and that becomes revenue for the firm. And then that revenue, in turn, becomes wages and profit for the factors, which becomes income, which becomes spending, and around and around we go. Good. There's a there's a question on, or maybe maybe. Something like, what are the components, or what does it show us, or something like that. There's something on the exam about it. Um, there's also in the book, just to kind of give you a heads up, is that, you know, the, the, this is really core stuff. I mean, this is like a closed, simple, as easy as it gets economy. And that there, there are other things that we have to account for eventually, which like would be in a, in a macro class, especially, but things like taxes and imports and exports and, um, you know, bleed offs and. Um, you know, there's all these other things that go into this eventually, but we're not particularly concerned about that right now. So, everybody good? Moving on, moving on, okay. Oh, just to reiterate, real quick, this is just the same thing again. So, so the firms are the ones that buy the factors of production and the households supply it. Um, I guess that's what I, that's uh, there. So the firms produce goods and services and buy factors production, we supply factors of production and buy goods and services. It's kind of just a reiteration. Alright, and story. since 1980-ish, you know, whatever, that technology has come and just sort of fundamentally changed land labor capital. And so, so now all of a sudden, you know, like for, for 2,000 years, we just go out and plant seeds in the field and hope for the best, you know. But all of a sudden, you know, in, in 1980, we start looking at, you know, GPS pictures and satellite maps and weather patterns and, you know, yada, yada. There's all this other stuff that's come into it. And so, Land has become much more productive than it was in 1965. You know what I'm saying? Okay, now that's true, and I, I'm not arguing that point. But I would also argue that, I think anyway, is that technology has really been there all along. I, I think. It's, it's like the first caveman that ever sharpened a stick and threw it at a dinosaur, technically, was using technology. That was redundant. 
but but was using technology, yeah. And and so I always sort of feel like it's getting it's uh, yeah, it became digital. I, I agree with that, but I don't think it came along. Do you know what I mean? I think it's been there the whole time. It's just uh, maybe it looks different now, but it's not different. So so you make your own decision about that. You know that's kind of how you feel about it. Um, on the exam, it's land, labor, capital. But then again, as we go on, you'll see technology keeps coming into it. You'll see it. Um, okay, the second model is the production possibilities frontier. And this one is probably 10 questions on the exam, and um, you will definitely need to know this. I mean, it's like probably 20% of the exam is on this. Okay, so PPF is the combinations of goods and services that we can produce. And let's just make it, we'll, we'll just keep it small for us just to kind of, you know, we don't, it could be a whole economy, but let's just talk about, let's say this class, you know, all 50 of us. So given the land labor capital that we have in this class, a PPF is a graph that shows the combinations of output that we can achieve based on what we have in this room. And you see also there's, there's technology again. And, and it, it, it's not that it goes away. I think, for, like I said, for me, it's just kind of how you look at it. Um, I, I tend to think it's not new. I think it's been around forever. But you know, other, other books that I've read have said it's a, it's a new thing. It's fundamentally changed our economy. So. Do you think that it's maybe slightly synonymous with capital? Yeah, I've heard that before, actually, is that the technology and capital are sort of intertwined. Um, that's actually a, a, an argument that comes up a lot. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't argue that. I mean, like today, you know, just thinking of some real core piece of capital equipment like a backhoe. I mean, in, in 1909, you know, it was an ox, <laughs> you know. And today they're air conditioned with stereos and GPS and, you know what I mean, very different thing. And it does a hell of a lot more work, yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. But then you could also argue, like I said, with the, you know, the GPS with the farms, and now, I mean, down to the meter, they know, you know, the, the sodium level, and the, you know what I mean? Very different than it was in 1900, where it was just hope for the best and pray a lot, you know? So, and, and also labor, too, has changed, you know, where, I, not to go on and on, but, but, you know, in 1700, we were worried, you know, if we farmed too far that way, we would fall off the edge of the world, so we wouldn't go, you know? And we've gotten better at knowing that, so our, our labor is more efficient. So, but yeah, I, I, it, it's intertwined with the capital for sure. Um, okay, everybody good? Okay, graphs, are, I think, and, and I, I don't know, but I think that one of the things about economics that's kind of intimidating is the graphs. And I think, especially for um, you know social science majors, which is absolutely fine, it's like, oh, you know, anything but that. And, and so we're going to do graph now, first one. We'll do lots, but um, if you don't understand this, if it's like, I, you know, I'm kind of getting it, but I just don't quite see where you're going with it, um, tell me, I'll, I'll save a few minutes after class and come up and we'll talk about it, because you really need to get this. And I, I, I think most people do, but if not, I don't want to embarrass anybody. I just, you know, come see me and we'll, we'll just make sure everything's really clear before we head out, okay? All right, um, so here we go. And again, sorry for those of you who've done this before. I just, I just, really easy. Um, here's our economy. And let's again, let's just say, make it simple. In our, our class of 50 here, um, given our available land labor capital and sometimes technology, given our, given that in, uh, input, we can produce along this line. Okay, that's our ability to produce whatever. And in this case, it's cars and computers. Okay, so we, we just to simplify it, make the model easy. I, I know there's, I mean, let me back up. There are there are models out there that it's really cool. I mean, they're they're fancy and stuff, but you can plug in like the real output of an economy. I mean, start talking about you know cars and clothes and textiles and you know computer, everything, and you can plug all that in, and it does this three dimensional graph of a PPF. It's really cool. I mean it. We, we, we have nowhere near the budget to be able to afford that in here, but so we're stuck with this. 
kind of cartoonish stuff, but you know, it's just a good thing. All right, so given our land labor capital, we can produce, we, we have a choice between, you know, our, our natural resources say that we should be making cars and computers. All right, and we have a choice. And just to make sure we're understanding this graph, if I'm making 3,000 computers, all right, so all of my resources are making computers, how many cars am I making? Zero. Zero. Okay, is everybody cool with that? I, I don't mean to sound, you know, like, duh, but just to make sure, because I know graphs can be a little. All right, so if all of my resources are making computers, then I've got nothing left. Everybody in this room is working in the computer factory. And so I've got zero cars being manufactured, so I'm sitting right up there on my, on my graph, okay, 3,000 and zero. All right, again, not, not to sound small, but just to make sure everybody understands. If I'm making just cars, how many computers? Zero. Zero, right? So all my resources now are into making cars, and I have nothing, you guys are all in the car plant now, and there's nobody left in the computer side, okay? All right, so anywhere along this curve, the blue line, anywhere we want to be, based on our given land labor capital, we can be, right? It just depends on what our economy requires. So you see points A and C. Is one superior to the other? No. Tell me why not. Well, if the desire for computers is more than the desire for cars, then it's fine. And, okay. Or vice versa, you know, if the desire for cars is more than the desire for computers, then you produce more cars. Okay, good. So. Yeah, that, that's pretty much right. And then, I mean, that is right, is, is that, what, what drives that for us is pretty simple. It's like, and I'm not, you know, I'm just giving an example. I don't really know this, but so like in Reading, you know, we're a little more rural. Um, and so maybe we have a little bit more of a need for cars here. Just, you know, it is. And as a result, if we build more cars, we have less resources for computers. So in, in Reading, we might be most efficient for our economy at point A. Yeah? If I lived in New York City, you know, maybe we have less need for cars, which would allow us to build more computers, more of an urban setting. So they have more computers to build cars. Not, not right or wrong, just the way the economy works for them, for us. Does that make sense? All right, um, point B. Can we reach point B? We can? Will we? Somebody tell me why not. It's inefficient. Somebody said, Charles, go ahead. We're not using all of our resources, it's inefficient. Okay, so how can I rationalize that? Let me see if I can justify that. Well, I can sit, let's say we're sitting at point B, I'm sitting here, and I realize, hey, there's a lot of idle workers in our economy. So I'm gonna put um, the idle workers to work in making computers, right? So I increase my computer production all the way up to, I don't know, 2,800 or whatever that is right in there, and I don't give up a single car to do it. You see what I mean? So, so there's idle resources, I increase my output of computers and I give up not one car. You know, inversely, I have a thousand computers, idle resources, I put you know, the, the idle resources to work, I get to 900 cars out here, don't give up a single computer to do it. Clear? Point D, can we reach that? No, no but why not? It's outside our ability. Uh, say it again? Outside our ability. Yeah, we just we don't have the land labor capital to do it, right? We just we're just not there yet. Will we be able to reach point D eventually? Hopefully. Yeah, exactly. What's going to drive that probably is new technology, and to a lesser degree in the United States immigration, um, and that's kind of a macro issue. But those are the two those are the two factors that grow economies. Often there are immigration and technology. Of course, the United States we have immigration. So, all right. Um, now the important question, not the important, the tougher stuff. What's the trade-off for computers to cars? If it's 3,000, 1,000, what's the logical trade-off? If I get one car, how many computers do I give up? If I get one computer, how many cars do I give up? One, one third, right? Okay. So it's a three to one ratio. Why isn't the line straight? Why isn't it, if it's three to one, why isn't it three to one, three to one, three to one, three to one? Why isn't it the same? Why is it, why is it convex, curved? Level of inefficiency. You have okay. to train car makers to make computers and they're not sufficient. Right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I'm sorry. You lose a little bit in the, in the transfer. transfer.
transfer. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so you said that there's like as you get closer to one edge or the other, there there starts to be more and more inefficiency, which is absolutely correct. Anybody else want to add on to that? Go for it. Quantity of goods at various prices. Kind of explain what you mean. Um, just like the, the onset of the price of the years. Oh, I, I see. I, I got you. Okay, yeah, so, so it's being driven by the price and the demand in the market. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, and that definitely plays a role, definitely. Anybody else?
I've never read it. I'm scared to read it. My ego can't handle it. But there, you know the rate, your professor? Do you know what that is? Yeah. Yeah, I can't read it. I can't. I mean, it's just like I cried. I'm like, they hate me. So, but I heard in there, somebody wrote, don't fall asleep. You'll have the whole class plotting against you. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> what the hell was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I live in Palisadro. <laughs> I live in Palisadro. Um, I live... I live in the teacher acres side of Palisadro, like the poor boy side of it. And there's some beautiful homes in Palisadro, but I don't live anywhere near them. I live on the other side. And where I live is like kind of hilly, and, and I'm up in, for those of you who don't know Palisadro very well, is that if, if you go north of, of Foothill High School and you get kind of on the chutes headed towards 299, you get into a valley there. And I live, I live up there north of Boyle a little bit. And if you look to the right, going north, if you look to the right side, there's wheat, uh, or, or grass, or whatever the hell it is, right? Something, let's just say wheat, is growing there. If you look to the left, there's wheat, 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 and then it turns into grapes. Now, I live, I live down on the west side of ways. I live up in the grape area, right? And um, all my neighbors have grapes. And I'm like, you know, here's my little brown teacher acres that haven't been tended to in two years. And all my neighbors with all their beautiful grapes. And as I go down the hill, it's grapes, 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 and then wheat, and then grapes, and then wheat, 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 wheat. Right? So, so think of it this way. The PPF is, is what you're looking at is that curve. Is that if I, let's say I own three plots of land from where I live, middle of the road, and then the flat part. This one is obviously going to be wheat. This one is obviously going to be grapes. This one will be somewhere in the middle. You know, it'll be one or the other. But if I convert, let's say the bottom field is wheat, second field is wheat, now the third field, which is way better at growing grapes, let's say I convert it to wheat. What kind of a jump am I going to get in wheat? Not so much. What kind of a loss am I going to get in grapes? Huge. Right? Make sense? So, so that's, that's kind of what you're looking at here is that, is that curve where what's better at growing what is being done, which is causing the curve to go out. And then when you get in the middle, then it's kind of a 50-50 trade-off. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? So far, so good? All right, there's going to be, like I said, like 10 questions on that, so be ready. Um, just real quick, um, th just some things we talked about here. The, the efficiency, meaning you know, what, what's good at cars should be cars. What's good at computers should be computers. Um, the trade-offs, you know how it's up here it's 1 to 1, over here it's 1 to 10. Um, opportunity cost, which you give up, and then now economic growth. Economic growth is a little bit tricky, and we'll do that next. So anyway, this, this is what we've looked at here, now, and now we'll go into economic growth. And I, I can't exactly remember. I mean, I'm not trying to just like, oh, you know, it's there. You know, I, I just don't honestly remember. But it's there is. There's going to be questions about, you know, on this curve, where would we be, and it would be point A and C, where would we be inefficient, where couldn't we be. Um, there's, there's a question about what drives economic growth, which we'll talk about in a second, but that kind of gives you a sense of what to expect on the exam. growth in economies now are immigration and technology. So more people, obviously more productivity. you got more workers. Technology makes pro productivity more efficient. And that's probably where it's at, right? Because you get better with using the same number of people who are better workers because they're you know, more educated, whatever. You can get more output with the same number of people. Make sense? Okay, so here's, here's how that looks. And, and I'll show you what the important part is. Okay. The original PPF is there, the 3,000, 1,000. So there, there it is. Okay. So now we have, let's, let's break the class into two. Um, we're sitting at point A, and we've got 25 people working in cars, 25 people working in computers. We're pretty efficient. 
All right, so time goes by, and so technology comes into the economy, okay? Now, if we took all 50 of us and we moved us into computers, we could be, instead of making 3,000, we can be making 4,000 computers. Does everybody see that okay? And no, no questions about that? All right, so go back to point A. Now, if we're at point A and we get a jump in technology, what happens is with the same 25 people, I can get a little more productivity out of the computer side. All right, make sense? All right, that adds to the productivity of the car side, and let me explain how. Assume that the, assume that the technologies come in, and let's say, and this is kind of, it doesn't say this here, but I'm just giving the example to make it work. The technology comes in, and now with the same 25 people, we can get to point E on the computer side, but with um, say 22 people, okay? New technology. Now instead of 25 people, I only need 22 to reach where I need to be in my economy. Okay, make sense? Like less input to attain the same amount of output or more because of the technology. What do I do with the other three workers? Lower into cars, right? So, so now I need less workers to get more computers because of technology and I can take the other three workers who are marginal computer workers, move them into making cars. So I get a bump in cars also. Does that make sense? Everybody follow that? So technology will hit one side of your PPF, which will cause you to have to work less hard to get more, which allows you to take that extra resource that you now have and dump it into the other side of your PPF. Clear? Everybody got it? Yep. Why doesn't that uh, equal uh, more car production? Why? Why doesn't it? If you took the extra, when you have extra, you jumped in. It does, and, um, and, and I'm glad you said that. I mean, it's good to clarify. See, so what happens, again, I mean, it's a great question. So, so we, we get technology, so now we're, we're able to move in the computer side. We have better technology, so now with 20, we have 25 workers, right? We have better technology, so now with 22 workers, I can get 2,100 computers, yeah? So I need fewer workers to get even more productivity because it worked well, a lot more efficient. Now I take those other, those three workers that were making computers, I throw them into the car side of things, and now they contribute an additional 50 cars to the equation. Okay, I was looking at the, the top line. Of right, right, right. Yeah, yeah I, I got it. 100,000 cars, that's what I was looking at. Yeah, yeah, see, the, the reason that this hasn't changed is because the technology in autos hasn't changed. If, if that was to have shifted outward, then of course, then it would be happening, but in the opposite direction. Okay. And, and another thought, just to, I mean, good point, really, is that if you get lots of immigration, then the whole PPF will shift out, you know, in a linear way. So, great, great point. Thank you. Everybody cool? Questions? All right. If, if there's anybody who's like, oh, not quite sure, just, just come see me. I'll, I'll give a few minutes after class, and if you want to come down and talk, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but certainly, certainly come down and see me if you're not quite sure what, what's going on. All right, um, any questions before I move on? Any at all? Okay, um, macro, micro, this is in a weird place. I'm sorry. You're gonna, there's a question on the exam, and I, I don't know why it's here. It should be like in screen one, day one, but I just, <laughs> it's been there for 10 years, and I've never moved it. Okay, macro and microeconomics. Um, macro is the study of full economic systems, you know, the U.S. or the global economy or you know, Australia or U.K. or whatever. Um, it has to do with government taxes and, you know, whole aggregate economic movements or recession, that kind of stuff. Um, microeconomics is a firm, an individual, um, you know, how a firm decides to hire people. Um, Marginal product of labor, utility, things we'll talk about in this class. <clears throat> and it, it's not as quite as easy as it looks. I mean, it's like, well, that seems simple enough, but it, it, it blends together, and, and let me show you how. I mean, I won't give you anything tricky on the exam, but just, just so you can see how it's like, I'm, the, the line gets kind of murky. Um, Walmart, is that a macro or a micro issue? Micro. Say it again? Micro. Micro? I don't know. I mean, when I went to Cabo San Lucas a few years ago, 
I went to, we got to the city center in Cabo San Lucas, and guess what was there? Walmart. Walmart with a McDonald's. <laughs> and they took American dollars. I mean, it was like, I was standing in Reading. It was bizarre. I mean, it could have been in Reading. If you, if you didn't know you were standing in Cabo San Lucas, that was bizarre. So they're everywhere, right? They're taking over the world. So what about that? So if I'm an employee at Walmart, or we're talking about the super Walmart in, where is it? Anderson. Anderson. If we're talking about that, then that's micro, right? Or if you're talking about how that Walmart came in and put, you know, whatever, Bob's tires out of business, you know, because they're, they couldn't, their marginal product couldn't keep up with Walmart, you know, that's a micro issue. But if, I think, I think if you look at Walmart Inc., I, I believe you're kind of looking at a macro issue. Um, you know, I, I think that there's, I, I know, well, I don't know this, but there's like 3,000 lawsuits in the United States against Walmart for price fixing. And, and that's, that's a nationwide phenomenon. I mean, that's the real deal. That's not just in Reading, you know what I mean? So that's affecting the whole economy, I think. Um, you guys know what price fixing is, by the way? Just let me kind of throw, it's kind of an interesting little anecdote, is that what Walmart gets accused of is... They open up a super Walmart next to Bob's Tires. And then tires are tires. I mean, they, they don't, you know, a, a Dunlap tire costs what it costs. You get it from the company in Michigan. But what they do is they lower their price below their average total costs. They, they, a Walmart will do this, and they'll take a hit on the price of tires. Guess for how long? until Bob's tires can't hang in there anymore. Because Bob's tires costs are changing, and he can't, or she can't, <laughs> Bob the girl, can't, <laughs> can't um, lower their price down below their average total cost because they don't have any other revenue to pad it with. So, so what happens is Walmart lowers the price of a tire below Bob's average total cost, and then they just wait. And they, and they, they yeah, they're taking a loss on tires, but they don't care because they're making so much with you know, all their other commodities. Bob can't do that because he doesn't sell anything else, right? So Bob tries and hangs in there and does the best he can, but eventually goes out of business. And then guess what happens to the price of tires at Walmart? Whoop, right back up to the average total cost plus a little bit, right? The thing is that Walmart, here's what happens, and it actually happened in Reading too, is that people, companies will sue Walmart and say, you guys are price fixing. You guys are, are creating an environment that's not competitive. The problem is Walmart tends to win because they can prove that it creates an efficiency for the customer. Because, well, yeah, we were under our, our average total cost for a while, but think about all the people in the community that benefit. I mean, all these people that got to buy tires below cost for a year, you're welcome, number one. And then number two is that when Bob's Tires hires, you know, Joe Schmo and Hinkle, Inc., LLC, JDs to take on Walmart, by the time he's got his $10,000 retainer in, Walmart's flown in $3 million a year retained attorneys from New York City. And, and they've lost before they've even started. This guy is, uh, the gal or whoever they hire is so outgunned legally, they have no chance. So. All right, so anyway, that's kind of a sidebar. But um, everybody close? I saw a hand. I'm sorry. I kind of, yeah, go ahead. t-shirt shop and pay $16 for a t-shirt because that's where his cost is at. Or you can go to Walmart and buy three t-shirts for 16 bucks. You know? Somebody's like, no, you can't. <laughs> no. <laughs> but but you get to what I'm saying. And, and so, Not everybody wants Walmart. What's that? Not everybody wants Walmart. I, I understand. And, and if, you, if you're a, 
any person, right? <laughs> Whatever. And, and I understand what you're saying. I really get it. I mean, it's like, well, Walmart, Walmart, Walmart. I don't want Walmart stuff. Well, that's fine, but prepare to pay more, you know? And, and I mean, I think for all intents and purposes, Walmart put the Ralph Lauren store out of business down in Anderson. Because people driving up the highway, they don't need polo <laughs> shirts. They need tires. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? And I think they effectively put them out of business. You know? But anyway. That, that's the problem. If you don't like Walmart, then don't go there, but be prepared to pay more. That's the problem. All right, um, let's see. One last thing, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is on the exam, and I'll, I'll tell you what's tricky. There's been, and this always is a, a, a cause for a lot of discussion after the exam. <clears throat> any science, you know, economic, any, any, any science. There's positive and normative. And... That, it's pretty simple. Positive statements are statements about fact. You know, statements of fact, I should say. And and so a positive statement would be, you know, four out of five dentists recommend sugarless gum. True, factual, quantifiable. Right. A normative statement would be, um, you should chew sugarless gum. Well, says who? You know, me. Because it's better for you. Well, how do you know? Because I think so. You know what I'm saying? So, so normative is just statement about what should be. Positive is a statement about what is, and, and quantifiably what is. And, and let me kind of show you why it's tricky. And I know a lot of you already know the answer to this, but I'll make a statement. Tell me, is it normative or positive? Um, there's too much hunger in the world. Normative, okay. So, but you see how it's tricky in that, in that, I, I think everybody in here would agree that you know nobody wants to see a, a you know a kid go hungry in the world today. Nobody. I mean, who, nobody. And I think we all agree that, that if if a kid is going hungry in the world, there's too much hunger. I mean, I don't think there's a single person in here that would say that's not true. So so it's a true statement, you know, on an ethical side of things, but but it's not quantifiable. I mean, and what's too much, you know? And now, if you were to turn it into you know. Doctors have estimated that, you know, one out of five people in the world is living under 1,200 calories a day, which constitutes um, famine or whatever, or, or hunger or whatever. Then that becomes positive, yeah. Right, so, so a statement of fact, something quantifiable versus something that you think, you know, or you believe. But, but it's tricky again because I think we all believe, you know, that, you know, we want well-being for mankind. So it, you say, well, that's definitely true. And all of a sudden, you're saying it's positive, but it's not. It's just your opinion. All right. How you guys doing? Everybody good? All right. Um, let me, a uh, couple of things. I'll, I'll talk to anybody who needs to talk about the PPS, and that, it's fine. Um, very important that you're here on Tuesday, uh, because we're going to do comparative advantage, and that's what quiz one is all about. So be here for sure. Um, Remember, homework's due next Thursday. Any questions? Um, yeah, hold on. Please have, yeah. How many problems do you Just one. Yep. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you all about it. It's just one question. <laughs> yeah, one, A, B, C, D, E, F. <laughs> I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you all about it. You'll, you'll, you'll be really well prepared. Bye. Have a good week. Weekend. <laughs>